Uh, I'm really thrilled um, to bring uh, Brie Williams uh, to the stage. Uh, now in 2011, Brie founded People Patterns um, to help uh, to make life easier uh, and to, to, to grow businesses. And I've been fortunate to know Brie uh, for a number of years. And actually, Brie, I know I owe you uh, $2. So this is that $2, $2 I owe you from some, some time ago. So, so thank you. Um, today, uh, Brie will be helping us to pull together some of the disparate elements uh, of, of behavioral economics uh, to help us better understand um, our propensity to be lazy, scared, and overwhelmed. Welcome to Nudge Stock 2020, Brie Williams. Oh, Dan, thank you. Thank you. This will come in very handy. Hello, Nudge Doc. You've just um, caught me as I'm tucking into some sticky dope pudding. Hope you don't mind. But I've chosen this because it reminds me of a story about behavioural economics. So a few years ago, I was at a restaurant with some friends. We decide to split a dessert because goodness knows you can't have your own. Comes out and we're like, this isn't what we ordered. We'd ordered sticky date pudding and we thought it would look like this. The sticky date pudding that came out looked like this. It was a deconstructed sticky date pudding. You know, you had a bit of dry cake over here and a sliver of caramel over there. It was revolting. Why am I telling you this? Because behavioural economics is like a deconstructed sticky date pudding. What I mean, of course, is that behavioural economics doesn't have a cohesive framework that pulls all of the hundreds of biases and heuristics together. That means when you're designing your nudge, it's very difficult to work with. So today for Nudge Stock 2020, what I thought I would do is share with you my model for designing behavioural solutions. I believe everything in business is about getting people from point A, what they're currently doing, to point B, what we would like them to do. The point of nudges is to do that more effectively. So that we can get people from point A to point B, we need to identify and overcome three behavioural barriers. The first is laziness. What do I mean by being lazy? It's really how we use our cognitive resources, how we use our brain. Take, for example, this image of two people catching an escalator into a gymnasium. It doesn't make sense and yet it's happening. What's the behavioural science around this lazy thinking? Well, it's the work of Daniel Kahneman and his metaphor for how we process information that he calls system one and system two thinking. Imagine you're driving a car. When you're driving that car to a familiar place, you're using your system one processing, which is automatic. It's the center of habits. It's easy. It's effortless. When you're driving somewhere that is unfamiliar to you, you're using system two processing. It's our slower paced thinking. It's deliberate thinking. So most of the time we use system one processing. That is our default mechanism. It's great most of the time, but sometimes it means that our decisions are less than optimal. It can make us susceptible to marketing messages, for instance, like up to 100% softer in one wash. So how do we address lazy thinking if we want to get people from point A to point B? The thought I want to share with you today is what I call the effort versus reward equation. Pretty simply, if effort is greater than reward, behavior won't happen. In order to overcome lazy thinking, we need to make sure we reduce effort and maximize reward make it easy to do the right thing and more difficult to do the wrong thing. By way of illustration, in this research, they were interested in whether the product's orientation, left or right, affected what direction people would swipe. Think of it as the Tinder effect. When the product was pointed to the right, that's where people swiped, regardless of whether the button was to buy or to cancel, and vice versa if the product was left. This is what's known as processing fluency. When things feel easy to do, that's what we tend to do. And another example in our local supermarkets during the pandemic, you will have seen social distancing cues. This of course is to make it easy for people to do the right thing. So I've talked about making it easy. You can also make things more difficult. 
Here's a cute example of how to make it difficult for people to leave their houses during COVID. Another example I loved during the pandemic, someone had the idea of squishing down toilet rolls. Why? Because when it was on the toilet roll holder, it was much harder for the children to take too much paper. So that's the effort side of the equation. The other way to engage lazy thinking is to maximize reward. You can make something seem better than an alternative and you can make it interesting. For example, you can make your offer look better than something else. This is the principle of anchoring. We see it here in this advertisement for mattresses. Why buy a Casper mattress for $9.95 when you can have a Chulo for only $7.50? And this is a brilliant example of how to get children to use soap. A bit like a Kinder Surprise, there's a toy inside the soap and they need to wash and wash and wash in order for that to be revealed to them. Okay, so that's barrier one out of the way. We can overcome lazy thinking by using the effort versus reward equation. Now let's talk about the second barrier, overwhelmed. This is known as the paradox of choice. The paradox is we desire the freedom to choose, but when we have choice, we can get overwhelmed by it. You've probably experienced the paradox of choice when you've tried to park your car in an empty car park. It takes longer to park because now you have myriad decisions. Do I park on the top level? Do I park at the bottom? Do I park near the exit? Do I park near the entrance in the shade? The paradox of choice came to us in a seminal study known as the jam experiment. Researchers presented 24 jams to shoppers. Now, six out of 10 people were attracted to taste the jams and 3% went on to purchase. In a different condition, they only put out six jams. This time, only four out of 10 stopped to taste the jams, but 30% went on to purchase. So our role to influence action, if we want to address this sense of overwhelm, is to make it clear which path is best to take. And the third and final barrier we need to overcome is that they are scared. We're talking here about the principle of loss aversion. If you're a fan of tennis, you'll know all about loss aversion. The first serve, people hit it hard, they hit it close to the line, because if it goes out, they get a do-over. They have nothing to fear. On the second serve, the stakes have changed. This time, if they miss the shot, they lose the point. So what happens? They slow the serve down and they hit a more conservative serve. This is loss aversion. We're more driven to avoid loss than seek gain. An interesting example played out in a study in supermarkets across America. The researcher was interested in whether we could reduce the use of plastic bags by either imposing a penalty or by giving people a bonus for reusable bags. Across 16,000 shoppers, the research found that providing a five cent bonus to shoppers did nothing to change their behavior. Introducing a five cent tax on plastic bags reduced usage from 82 to 40 percent. So what do we do if we're trying to overcome people's sense of fear? Two strategies. To influence action, we need to give people nothing to fear if they do take the action, but something to fear if they don't. Let's look at nothing to fear. Nothing to fear comes in the form of assurances. So things like money back guarantees, satisfaction guarantees, credibility cues, and here we have an example of normalizing the use of masks. The second strategy is to give people something to fear if they don't take the action. Some retailers have become very savvy when it comes to doing this. They want to influence us to return our shopping trolleys. How do they do that? They make us put in a $2 or a $1 deposit, for instance. We are driven to get our money back by returning the trolley. The retailers are using our fear to drive behavior. Something to fear isn't a new strategy. You would have seen this a lot. Limits per customer, limited time offers, expiration dates. These are all designed to heighten our fear of not taking action. A clever example of using something to fear to direct behavior was in the sale of hand sanitizer. Sure, you could get one bottle rather cheaply, but as soon as you buy two, it becomes a very expensive proposition. Well, that's it, Nudge Dockers. 
I hope in our short time together, the Williams Behaviour Change Model has helped you understand and wrap your arms around the magical field of behavioural economics. With this foundation of behavioural economics, I hope you'll enjoy the rest of what MadgeDoc has to offer. I've got plenty of resources on my website, including you can audit your business for its behavioural effectiveness and even take a behavioural IQ test. Bye for now. Oh, Sam, do you want your two dollars? Do you want your two dollars back? Thanks so much, Bree. Appreciate that. I'll keep that in my pocket until the next time we meet. Thank you for arming us with those uh, brilliant examples and such a, a, health, a helpful framework.